my children are dying what do i care of the planet in order to get me to be interested in saving the planet you got to be able to make me interested in my own life you know we've just been through and and some parts of the world are still going through um does the pandemic experience make you more or less hopeful about um you know our capacity to to mitigate and adapt to to the environmental crisis in the time scale that's required and and i feel like you know sitting here in london i i could argue both ways um less hopeful because of of our demonstrated capacity to to um accept suffering elsewhere in the world uh if it could mitigate our own um more hopeful because of the miracle of these mrna vaccines research developed commercialized in in record time um it really is a kind of you know a a technological miracle and so i feel that conflict and I, and i feel that tension um i see all of the possibilities for us to innovate our way um out of the increasing stressors on our present and future um and i also see our our inability to you know to work on it in a global integrated fashion so i i'm curious how how you've reflected upon the pandemic experience as it relates to the work you're doing on climate and environment and just an open question to to the the campfire well um of course i agree with you i think um you know it certainly seems that the experience uh from the pandemic uh certainly makes me feel less optimistic when it comes to international cooperation when faced with a common threat <laughs> it didn't come about uh at all it was just amazing if anything that has come close to something that threatened the entire world all the populations and the economies of all the countries in recent years it would have been covid-19 uh but yet there has been so little cooperation i think so little cooperation is an understatement there has been hostilities <laughs> much worse worse than lack of cooperation i mean it's been used as it's been weaponized almost in geopolitical uh, uh struggles uh and and propaganda you know so that that certainly makes us makes me feel less optimistic about climate uh and and our capacity to cooperate uh and 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 transcend geopolitical and economic rivalries um to combat climate change um there are signs of optimism like you said uh technological innovation and also um it, from a chinese experience the last two years the you know state capacity that the, the government the state does have the ability to organize its population against a, 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 a threat like covid-19 but that capacity is very uneven among the countries in the world um so i think it's a it's a difficult lesson i'd say i would agree with that i would just add that you know as much as the world didn't come together to address covid it did a lot much more than it's taking the climate crisis seriously i mean if if the world came together even as much as it did for covid for climate in such a short period of time we wouldn't be in the situation we're in now and yet it's every bit as much an existential threat and you could trace more deaths to what's happening from the climate crisis than than has happened with covid and yet again our governments are not doing the number one thing they're supposed to do which is to protect their citizens sorry vj go ahead no no terry please uh, that's an important point i mean um i want to pick up on the mrna vaccine because it it really gives us a sense of the advances of technology and the hideousness of our world um i agree with you you know that was incredible um and by the way the vaccine was produced as you know not all by private initiative a lot of it government funding in universities and so on university of pennsylvania played a role um things we know um we looked at botswana at the current rate of vaccination in botswana a country in africa botswana will reach 70% of vaccination in the year 2100 J- just to underline that okay we we are right now in 2022 at the current rate of vaccination botswana will get 70% in 2100 that's the value of mrna for the people of botswana i mean we have come up with incredible technology around the planet 
incredible technology. But the hard barrier between the rich and the poor is insurmountable, you know, and we really need to think seriously about that. Elon Musk, for instance, is now eager to fly his SpaceX satellites over the African continent where he was born in order to provide internet services. Um, in Zambia, 60% of the children who live above the copper, you know, Zambia is one of the world's leading producers of copper. 60% of the Zambian children who live above that copper don't know how to read and write and most likely won't go to school. So under their feet lie the copper, which enable all of us to talk right now. But the children whose parents go and mine the copper can't go to school. I mean, these are the hard realities um, that are going to really prevent us from advancing using the highest form of technology to advance, save the planet, build a better civilization, etc. And let, let's be clear about this. Why is Zambia in such a difficult state? Well, you can go to Lusaka and talk to the government if you'd like, but actually you learn more if you fly to Washington, D.C. and talk to the IMF. Um, because what the IMF has done since 1991 to Zambia is extraordinary. I mean, the enforced cuts on education have been systematic. Every year, the government of Zambia is basically told, I mean, talk about democracy. Countries that go to an IMF loan program basically surrender their democratic right to their budget. Uh, budgetary decisions are made by the staff team that comes and visits them. You know, I, I've interacted a lot in Kenya and Zambia with government, the finance ministries, and they tell you directly, there's no point talking to the parliament about the budget. The most important constituency for the budget is in the IMF office in Washington. So, you know, technology is available. I agree with you, Chris, that was an amazing event, you know, the discovery or rather the implementation of mRNA, correct? Incredible how swiftly it came to market and so on. But th therein lies the, lies the rub. How swiftly it came to market. How swiftly it came to market for whom? And who could afford it in the market? Um, we are living in a grotesquely unequal world. And we can't say that the inequality is you know, because those people are deprived or whatever. I mean, after all, they produce the copper, which is essential to our civilization. You know, copper is not an arcane. We're not talking about the Bronze Age, the Copper Age. We're talking about computers. We're talking about wires. We're talking about uh, many of the micro components inside smartphones and computers. I mean, those minerals and metals are being mined in countries where children have very high literacy, uh, illiteracy rates. They have high illiteracy rates. That has to be on the table. You know, you can't talk about a green transition unless you also talk about democracy and literacy because a country won't be able to have a conversation about moving its social wealth into a green transition if the country has not got the basic fiber of having that conversation, if you see what I mean. You know, other things are what Franz Fanon called obstinate facts, such as hunger. These delay your interest in saving the planet. You, you, you basically say, look, my children are dying. What do I care of the planet? In order to get me to be interested in saving the planet, you've got to be able to make me interested in my own life. And I think we forget that sometimes in these conversations. Well, I mean, the IMF is nothing but the IMF is but a, a part of a big global financial system that kind of dominates all the political and economic activities of private actors and governments. Um, I mean, I think that's probably the big elephant in the room.